Good morning, good morning, good morning, Second Baptist and my Facebook friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and as always, we should rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited about hearing about the word on today. I'm excited that God given me another opportunity to stand before you and let you know that he lives, he lives, he lives. I'm here to encourage you. Hold on to God's unchanging hand, and he will never fail you. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Let me sing it one more time, cool. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show us the way from the grave to the cross to bless me today from the earth to the sky, from the sky to the grave. Lord, I lift your name on high. Come on, put your hands together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt you paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You know why? You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt you paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. One more time, quote. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the grave to the cross. My debt you paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. 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 God, we praise you. God, we bless you. God, we thank you for your deliverance in our lives. God bless you. Good morning. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed us now till we want no more. Now may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength 
And I will redeem and all the people of God all over the world. Say amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey and Earl and all others who thought it not robbery together in support that we may continue to go forward in this moment. I want to thank God for all who are joining us, Facebook Live and teleconference. And for those of you who were not able to join us in this moment, perhaps sometime throughout today, you will have an opportunity to revisit. It is our prayer that you will continue to pray for us as we will continue to pray for you. And so we have come again at this moment, an hour that we might share together one with another along the lines of our discussion today. And one is wondering, and I'm sure, well, well, what will that be today? I promise not to keep you long, but somehow I feel that the Holy Spirit is causing us to resonate in a very familiar territory. Uh, most of us are aware it is or has to do with uh, the Beatitudes, and so what it is, uh, I know some are wondering, what, what is it are you going to say today, Reverend, well, relative to Beatitudes? I think it would be important, first of all, to uh, cite the text in which we will be speaking from, uh, one that we have been spending time in and considering for this moment. It is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse number 6. Some of you are already or have been made aware, or at least along the lines of our thinking, and what will we say today relative to uh, this moment for preaching. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse number 6. It is there you will find these words recorded. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If the Lord's willing for a few moments, I want to talk to you, sit it around some discussion concerning the idea, the matter of Eden. <laughs> I know some say, Eden? Yeah, that, that's what I say, Eden. And it is there that I want to solicit for a few moments from the text in this being another communion Sunday, another opportunity to reflect and to be in keeping with the divine mandate of our God. And inasmuch as we do it, we do it in remembrance of him. And when I look at this chapter five here, I discover the beginning of what some would call a lengthy sermon. It's lengthy in nature because it is here from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, all the way to chapter 7 is a continuation of a merit of teaching that Jesus sought it and thought it necessary to unpack and to make the, the disciples and the children of God one more time. He used this as a teaching moment. And what you will discover that in verse 29 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 7, you will find the completion or the concluding of Jesus' teaching. And might I add that the text says that he taught with authority, which would suggest to me that he was very confident in his delivery he did not uh, make any grammatical errors about uh, using this moment and this time to educate and to enlighten not only the, the disciples, but all who would come later thereafter and now be called children of God. 
It is here that the Lord wants to make parenthetically sure uh, that we understand what is expected of us based on our human response in the kingdom of God. And I thought it was necessary to highlight this little sermon from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, to verse number chapter 7. It is a continuum, a series of teachings that Jesus talks about such things as to don't worry. He teaches us seemingly when he begins in chapter 5, he gives us a myriad of oxymorons or paradoxes that would seem to suggest that to the kingdom of God, we're clear on what it is that God wants us to do. But when we look at the society and the society in which we live, it almost seems opposite. Mm -hmm. based on our response and behavior to the teachings of our Lord. So, well, Reverend, what makes you so sure that he was teaching? Well, the text says that Jesus goes up into a mountain. And because he was inundated and surrounded by so many who had heard about him, they had become aware of his fame. Uh, they were aware of his divine ability. They had heard that this Jesus was on uh, the journey of healing and deliverance. So now Jesus has the opportunity to now speak to the multitude, the crowd that wanted to hear what he had to say. And I can almost imagine that in the closing of this sermon that the text writer would ensure and secure within the text, it gives some uh, idea or illustration or impact or power as to how Jesus was able to deliver. Mm. It seems to me that Jesus sought the opportunity to move himself to some elevated place. Uh, he moved to a mountaintop while the multitude down below him was looking and expecting and anticipating to hear the great teachings of our Lord. And I one has to wonder, would Jesus teach anything or say anything to anybody if it was not going to be a benefit and a value to you? I thought I would just inject that question right now. And you have to consider the validity of that what Jesus teach. All I'm doing today is a reiteration of what Jesus offered already said. It is here that we want to talk about in light of this another communion moment then to find a text that would be suitable to engage us as we have assembled or as we have prepared ourselves before the tube in our homes and our living room, bedroom, kitchen and dining room. There may be some other places that you're able to tune in. That's neither here nor there. It's irrelevant. But the fact of the matter is, here we are for another communion discussion. And while Jesus elevates himself from a platform that he may speak loudly and clear, and that those who are at the foot of Jesus are listening attentively, and they want to make parenthetically sure that they are not missing anything, that they are interpreting everything, that they are receiving what Jesus is providing. Well, Reverend, what can you say here now? We are, this is Communion Sunday, and for me, for years, it is always thrust upon me to try and be relevant or at least to give some instructions or some background or some insight on why we do what we do. And it is here that I focus more on the text in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse number 6. Where Jesus declares in light of all of his teachings, he says, he starts off by saying, you are blessed. It is a, uh, uh, a validation of fact that Jesus begins his myriad of teachings, his series of paradoxes. And to say to, to the believers, to the disciples and all others, uh, what is the expected character and behavior of the children of God? He says in verse number, chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Blessed are they who hunger 
and thirst after righteousness. For they shall, there's no question about it, there's no doubt about it, there's no ambiguity about it. If they hunger and thirst after righteousness, the Bible says, for they shall be filled. Tap your neighbor. Say, anybody hungry? Mm. And so we come today, and somehow I thought to at least uh, uh, offer for a controlling thought something that we all are familiar with. And since the text is suggesting, uh, or, or Jesus already stating and uh, declaring that blessed are we for those of us who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for we shall be filled. So it is here in the communion observance, it is here in the communion moment that Jesus, the word of God, has in, invites us to this place again. That we sit before this table, we administer the elements of communion. And the essence of doing it is the only reason why God has declared and made it his prerogative that we will always remember and never forget. And it is here that Jesus has invited us to the table in light of communion. But when I think about eating, for all of us ought to know something about that, is that here is the opportunity for us to be filled. And many of us, we just love to eat. I know I'm right about it. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but I'm trying to make a point. The point here is, is that the, the, the word declares to say that blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness and they shall be filled. So we have come to this place of trying to uh, put emphasis or acknowledge how we eat. And so when we come to this table, could it be that we have had a misappropriation of the concept of what Jesus has purported that we do? I recall uh, some time ago that there was a song many of us remember by the Truthettes. A young group was singing a song that went, uh, the title of it was, I don't want no peanut butter and jelly. I just want my soul saved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the little boy was at church and the preacher, and that's, you know, I found it amazing and ironic that somehow I would be in meditation on verse number six. And then how in preparation, how in considering, how we would deliver this message uh, today concerning or centered around Eden. This uh, song has helped me. And if you would indulge me for a few moments to highlight the lyrics or the essence of the song, this little boy goes to church and the preacher must have been preaching from this very topic. Matthew chapter 5 verse number 6. He says, the blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. In this song recorded by the truth that this little boy was in church. He heard the preacher preach, and after the sermon, he runs up to the pastor. He said, preacher, thank you. You bless my soul today. And I'm sure now the preacher want to know how did that happen. And the little boy began to say when you said something about blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, somehow the Holy Ghost uh, landed upon him. Somehow a conversion was made in that moment and in that instance. He, be, he accepted the Lord Jesus as his personal Savior. It, I don't know what all the preacher said, 
But at the end and the conclusion of the service, the little boy goes up to the preacher and said, thank you, you bless my soul today. And I want to use in my own mind that this little boy was happy. He really didn't understand what was really going on inside of him. All he knew that he had heard the voice of God. All he knew that what the preacher was preaching, he was right there with him. And the Bible says when service was over, the little boy and his mother, went on home and when the boy got home he was still fired up he says something to his mama he said mama I'm hungry oh see every mother when a child say that they want something to eat I don't believe there are many mothers that would hear the utterance and the expression of a child saying to their parent I'm hungry the only thing left to do is to do something and get busy and make way to the kitchen that's what this mother did she said son I hear you come on in the kitchen I'm gonna fix you something to eat the little boy noticed his mama she went up to the cabinet she reached in and she pulled out some peanut butter. Then she reached into the refrigerator and some jelly on the side. And the little boy said, wait a minute, maybe mom didn't get this. But what I was saying to mom, that I'm hungry, not for no peanut butter and jelly. Mm. But I want my soul to be saved. <laughs> Yeah, he, he was feeling in the moment when the preacher said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The, the little boy was about ready to be filled up. You see, mama misinterpreted, mama misappropriated his hunger, thinking of something physical. Oh, God help me. But what he was really crying for was... For something spiritual. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come to this place. In light of this moment. This uh, communion reflection. And I'm reminded even in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you will study there. Go there sometime or another. At verse number 20. You will discover that the matter at hand today was discussed in the first Corinthians chapter 11 verse number 20 it goes on to talk about how we operate and how we worship the things we do when we are in church the things and the behavior we have when we are in the Lord's house and when we come together for communion that we should have uh, the greatest uh, interest at heart what is that Reverend I'm glad you asked that is the interest and the concern of everybody else Oh, the apostles were appalled to discover that while in Corinth, Paul was letting it be known uh, their misbehavior or disregard, uh, their unpious exhibiting of their belief in our Lord. The Bible will suggest that there were those at the point and place of worship that they would come with their food, then they came not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, there were those who seemed to just look forward to just coming to the Lord's house for this particular meal called communion that to them, all it really was just an opportunity to indulge. Hmm. But not only when we think about eating and as the Lord has invited us to this table. And as we know, the many tables that exist in our uh, world and in our experience, I know some, some of us are even can't hardly wait to Thanksgiving come now. Oh, bro. Move on, Reverend. That's a little bit too far away. But no. I'm sure that there are those who've been thinking about the Thanksgiving meal you had last year. And you are on pins and needles. You can hardly wait to Thanksgiving come around again. Why? Because we love. Okay. I know I got you with me right now. So, at Corinth, 
Not only were they bringing food and eating before others was ready, not discerning that there were some poor people or not discerning that there were slaves or not discerning that there were a mixed multitude of people that would come for this communion moment. And those who were wealthy, those who had a six-figure paying job, those, those who had it going on, when, when they drive up on the campus, oh, everybody stopping their track. Oh, God, help me. And marvel at the type of vehicle they drive. It was those that would suggest that came in to this feast, to this communion, being selfish and inconsiderate of anybody else. They were all about me, myself, and I. Y'all, you know anybody like that? <clears throat> And so what appalls the apostles is the fact that they carried on like this. And they thought they weren't doing anything wrong. And the apostles said, is this what you think of coming to the Lord's house? You, you look, what y'all doing and getting, oh, oh my him. Look, I ain't making this up. The text says not only were they feeling their belly, but they also had some altering spirits. Anybody know what altering spirits are? You intelligent. They were drunk. They were inebriated. They were tipsy. In the house of God? Oh, no. You don't have that in this uh, new dot-com generation, no. But the apostles... Uh, made the indictment and was appalled to how they were behaving as it respects to, uh, as it relates to the value and the sovereignty and sacredness of communion. In fact, lastly, the apostle said, look, what y'all doing, this is not discerning the Lord's body. I don't know what you call that. But look, if you want to eat, eat at home. Avoid coming to the Lord's house and desecrating the essence of that what God has instituted to be sacred and for us to reflect and remember that we are only here because God loved us so much that he was willing to lay down his life and die for you and me. Okay, you want so much about eating and uh, being hungry. And I'm understanding that the text not only speaks of that blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, uh, for they shall be filled. Here's point number two. Point number one is being hungry. Point number two is, now uh, we're thirsty. So when Jesus makes the declaration, said, blessed are the one who hungers, that you are hungry for God. You want to live for God. You, want, you don't want no peanut butter and jelly. That what you want requires and demands something greater than the physical. So when we look at Thirst. Oh, what is it then to be thirsty? I'm, I like the way John paraphrased it. He says that Jesus is my bread when I'm hungry. Help me somebody. He's my water. Oh, yeah. When I'm thirsty. It's something about hunger and being thirsty in the right modality in order that we might receive supernaturally that what is beyond our physical. Help me, somebody. Yeah, somebody said, hit replay on that one. Run that by me again, Reverend. <laughs> what I like about social media, you can look at it as many times as you want to. If you miss something the first time, you have the luxury and the technology to hit replay. In fact, I hope there are those of you who are even considering doing a replay and passing it on. What do you say? Start a watch party. Yeah, because we all know what it means to eat. 
And sometimes I want to suggest that when we come to the table to fill our physical bodies, we may have a misappropriation, oh God, of what our intent is as it relates to eating. But when we come to the Lord's house, we have to or must discern the Lord's body. Because if you come and partake of communion and have ulterior motives, then the Bible said there are those who are sleep and those who are sick. Uh, why, Reverend? Because they have misappropriated and misinterpreted the Lord's body. I can't keep you long. I don't want to keep you long. Let me say something more about this thirst. Anybody know what it is to be thirsty? I mean, you, you're parched. If you don't get something to drink, you're going to exit. <laughs> but uh, what I really want to make reference to, since we are uh, under the light, this is our social media moment. Here we are, continuing to try and make the word known or give relevance uh, to what we're doing. Oh, let's visit the water. I I'm reminded uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 4, that, that there was a Samaritan woman uh, that decided to come to the well. And Jesus encounters this woman. He was on his way somewhere, but he had to go by way of uh, Samaria. While the, the disciples were uh, moved into the town, the text says that they went into the town to buy some meat. Huh. What you say, Reverend? That right there, if we didn't believe uh, in the essence of Eden, even in the, the comprising and, and the forming of this text, when Jesus meets this woman at the well, the disciples was out trying to get some teat. <laughs> what you said, Ruff, some teat? What, what is some teat? Oh, God, that's, so, that's, your, that's, that's somebody in your house. Go, go, go to your neighbor. Go, go next door. Knock on the door. Say, hey, what is some teat? <laughs> Something to eat, really. That, that's all it is. Um, and this woman... She comes to the well and Jesus sees her and she says, first of all, by observation, uh, what have Jews to do with Samaritans? And Jesus heard her, but he didn't really respond. And he really rests on the idea, said, lady, all I need is a cold drink, a dip of water. She said, I don't have anything to dip the water out with. She said, how is it that Jews will not have anything to do with Samaritan? And how is it that you single me out? And this woman asked, Jesus says to her, I said, woman, if you knew who was asking you for the water, that the water I give, oh God, you will never thirst no more. You see, the water and food that we are trying to purport today. It goes beyond and deeper than our physical dependency on food. And my brothers and sisters today, as I hasten to leave you now, my whole conjunction in my review of this uh, a theological narrative uh, as it relates to the gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6. It's where Jesus declares that blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And they shall be filled. Unlike the characters uh, delineated in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where they made haste to come to the place of worship, and uh, they weren't thinking about nobody else. Uh, they were only thinking 
about themselves. And the apostles say, if this is the way and the behavior you're going to exhibit, uh, uh, don't even bother to come back here no more. Because until uh, we uh, have an idea of what we are dealing with, until uh, we understand that our need to connect with our Lord uh, is greater than any fried chicken. Yeah, that our need to connect with our Lord, yeah, is greater than a glass of water. But I'm glad that we have access to the God that created us. And I'm glad that when we come to this table, uh, this table uh, is a reflection, uh, an opportunity for us to be reminded uh, what the Lord uh, did on Calvary. And I'm glad that some of uh, the violations that occurred uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it exceeded and went beyond their physical need. But I stopped by to tell you uh, on my way to my seat that sometime we can misappropriate, uh, we can misread, uh, we can misinterpret uh, what the Lord is trying to say to us. And I'm glad that I've come to a place uh, to realize that sometimes we eat uh, like ain't nobody else is around. We eat until our belly become full. We eat and we love to eat. But might I add another view uh, when we or as we love to eat? Well, what are some things we love to eat, Reverend? Uh, I'm not going to go there. I know some of y'all love pizza. Some of y'all love some oxtails. Some of y'all love some fat back meat. Oh, yeah, because I love it myself. Some of us, we love a myriad of things. And I'm all right. Whatever we eat or whatever we like, we consume moderately. Yeah, but when we become overindulged, yeah, there are consequences. But I'm glad that today as I leave you, as we are about to step down and lead the people in another communal moment. But I close today to simply say this. The next time we feel hunger and thirsty, we got to know that what we are hungering for and that what we are thirsty for, it goes beyond the physical analogy. Yeah, even though that when we eat a nice full meal, and most of the time that all we want to do after we have filled up. Yeah, I don't need to say it. Some of y'all or most of y'all have already said it for me. I know how we think and I hear what you said. Just don't sleep too long after you have consumed a very sumptuous meal. Yeah. But what Jesus is admonishing us to come to this table and partake of him. We come discerning the Lord's body. We come understanding that there are those who are less fortunate. We come to eat right. Yeah, so that we can be full and nourished. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. But I'm going, 
I'm going to my seat now. But what I came to tell you, yeah, that the next time you pull up to your table, yeah, you can eat all of the trimming you want to. You can eat all of the turkey you want. You can eat whatever you want to eat. But what I'm trying to leave with you, that sometimes there are those, it goes beyond our physical need. I want to suggest that our physical need is a typology of our spiritual need. Yeah, I want to suggest that our physical hunger, yeah, it denotes that we are hungry for Jesus. Yeah, I want to suggest that when we become physically thirsty, yeah, that we become physically thirsty for the spiritual of our God. Yeah, but Jesus invites us to come to this table that we might partake of the elements again. Yeah, what does that do for you, Reverend? It reminds me over 2,000 years ago what my Lord, yeah, he came and he didn't want to die. But he went to the garden. He said, Lord, if it be your will, not my will, Lord, but thine will be done. If, Lord, you allow this cup to pass from me, not my will, Lord, but thine will be done. Yeah, I want to close by simply stating up front that when we hungry, when we're thirsty, I want you to take it to another level. The next time you sit at your table, you got to remember and acknowledge the possibility that there is a greater need. There is a greater hunger. There is a greater thirst that only God can feel your thirst. That only God can cause you Eden, how have you been eating? My only point, so we're getting ready to eat again. We're getting ready to partake of this Holy Communion one more time. Jesus declares unto us, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled it doesn't matter if you are a subscriber of social service welfare assistance we gotta eat whether you are doing very well on your six figure income eating porterhouse Rib I steak. We all got to eat. But my brothers and sisters today, beyond that, deeper than that, our soul is longing to be fed with the power and the presence of a mighty God. died on Calvary that we might be full till we won't no more bread of heaven bread of heaven feed us now till we won't no more Amen. Amen. And since many of you was aware that we were going to have this moment, I hope you're prepared, you're ready to secure some grape juice or juice. 
bread, crackers, or whatever. Water will suffice and just a small piece of bread. We're about to enter this moment of reflecting that as we come to this physical table to partake of these spiritual, physical slash spiritual elements, let us know as we feel severe need to dine and partake and indulge and eat to satisfy our physical requirement before your next bite know that there is a greater hunger and a greater thirst for our soul we can claim like the little boy in the story I don't want no peanut butter and jelly I just want my soul to be saved. Wherever you are all over the world, if you are unsaved and don't know Jesus, we invite you to get to know him. If there's somebody in your life you know who is spiritual, who is a spiritual guardian, or one you look to for guidance and spiritual encouragement, let them know that something is going on inside of you and that you're your soul desires to be saved. If you don't know anyone, you can email me and I will be happy to walk with you through the plan of salvation. May the Lord continue to bless all of my father's children real good. And so now we come to this table for communion. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he, he took the bread and he blessed it and he breaked it and he gave it to his disciples. He said to them, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you partake of this cup, this do in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and said, this is the fruit of the vine. We will not do this again until we are in my Father's kingdom. As often as you partake of this cup, this do in remembrance of me. If no one has been omitted, we will all now eat and drink together. To my father's children, and to all who are listening, may the Lord continue to bless you and keep you real good. You are always in our prayers, and I miss seeing you, Second Baptist. I love you all so much. I'm, I'm looking forward to when we can come back home. Peace until we meet again.